Okay, welcome everyone to the very first panel in the Quiet Before series. Uh, my name is Ryan Lee Wong. I will be the moderator for this evening. Um, I'm very happy to have um, a wonderful panel of speakers tonight. Um, Jack Chen, Franklin Odo, May Nai, Ted Gong, Pat Eng, May Chen, Vijay Prashad, and Kevin Nadal. Um, our topic tonight is history, um, but this, of course, is not history for its own sake. It's not a removed history. Um, our goal and our hope for this panel this evening is to talk about how um, the anti-Asian violence we're facing in this moment, how this extremity of everything from small microaggressions to murders um, is not something that's random, is not something that started with Donald Trump, um, is not something that is inexplicable, but um, is, I think, part of a deep set of American policies and cultural practices um, that have their roots um, at, at least 100 years back. And so um, our hope tonight is to lay out a groundwork and a framework for understanding this moment through these lenses of um, different historical moments, different historical policies, um, different cultural phenomena that set the stage for what we're seeing today. Um, our second goal or hope with this evening is to really set um, a framework for the subsequent quiet before panels. So um, we have a lot of wonderful panels coming up on um, culture and arts and the context of um, anti-Asian violence in this moment. Um, and so with this group of panelists, um, we'd like to offer something um, to chew on, to um, ground us in a shared understanding and a shared history of um, how we define Asian America and how we define uh, the anti-Asian violence at this moment. Um, I just wanna say in regards to this panel, um, the reason I was really um, excited to do this panel amidst um, what is really a difficult time for our communities is that the people on this panel um, have done a tremendous amount to build the actual language and the actual histories and the actual stories, the institutions, um, the arts and cultural places and practices that have defined um, what we call Asian America today. Um, and that's no small thing. Um, so on a personal level and also on a community and social level, um, I think we're really lucky to be able to speak um, together as a group and to assemble this group of um, scholars and thinkers and activists and historians. Um, so the way the format for this evening will work is that um, I will start with um, a set of questions posed to each of our panelists um, in pairs. Um, each of them will have a few moments to respond. And then um, we'll open up into a little bit of a more free flowing conversation and then um, for the last 20 or 30 minutes, um, we'll have questions from the audience. And if you'd like to ask a question, you can use the chat feature and we'll have people on the back end relaying those questions to me when the time comes. Um, so we are going to start with Pat Eng, who is going to speak a little bit about um, her work in Asian American philanthropy um, and also um, a little bit about um, the incident that's probably one of the, at the forefront of many of our minds, which is the Atlanta shootings and um, the intersections of migration and language and economic precarity that um, a lot of Asian women workers in particular are facing um, and the histories that, that led up to um, and set the background for what happened in Atlanta. So I'll hand it over to Pat first. Well, Thank you so much, uh, Ryan, and thank you um, for this kind invitation. I'm so humbled to be part of this really esteemed group of speakers, historians, scholars, activists, right? And, and to all of you who are watching this webinar, I may not actually see you, but I know you're there, and I'm really grateful to be in community with you, especially at this time. 
I'm coming to you today on Munsi Lenape lands, although the street that I'm on is named after the Iroquois people. So it's been such a busy year, months, weeks, and many days, and I have to confess I lost track of many things. This last year has been a blur in particular, the past five or six weeks have been in particular um, um, just a frenzy of activities. And so I didn't even realize, full confession, I didn't even realize that I was supposed to be on this panel until this morning. So um, while I apologize for running out due to a conflict in scheduling, I'm actually really relieved that I don't have to follow the brilliance of the others on this panel. So there's one good thing to be said about that. Um, so just a few minutes, um, in the few minutes that I have, here's what comes top of mind. And, and again, I'm not an historian or a scholar. I don't even know how I got through school, which for me really feels like ancient history. Um, actually, this year is my 40th. Um, college reunion. So it's like, wow, time really flies um, when you're having fun or not. Um, I want to say that I've lived the equivalent of several lifetimes of members of our communities whose lives have actually been cut far too short, right, by violence, particularly trans women of color. And I know that the work I do is only possible because of those who've come before me. Right, And my lived experiences, I feel, are my most precious credentials. So I've spent a good part of my life early you know, on working on issues of gender-based violence, which is why I think I was invited to uh, participate here. But I've learned that I can never escape. I, I can't escape it, whether through episodic news cycles like the shootings in Atlanta and Indianapolis, or even closer to home through the lived experiences of family and friends, or through racist policies and practices threaded throughout this nation's infrastructure and throughout history. And I know that many of you will be able to speak to that much more clearly than I can. But I was asked to reflect on the Atlanta shootings and what they may reveal about the ways immigration, history, language, education, you know, affect uh, Asian women in industries like massage parlors and sex work. And I would say that it's everything we know about the harsh intersections of race, class, and gender played out with horrific consequences. Policies that are debated and passed, you know, in single issue areas like immigration, education, labor, you know, across different systems, right? They, they come together with nuanced complexities and implications that fall hardest on women of color, especially, right? And especially at the most modest income levels. And so while women of color are often the backbone of family and community stability, as I think we all you know, really recognize, their contributions often go unrecognized and undervalued, taken for granted. For immigrant women especially, I think the choices are so limited across multiple realms of family, education, and employment. And if we're talking about an industry created for male pleasure that treats women as sex toys rather than human beings, then women in the oldest profession in the world are often punished for that work, and their lives are often considered throwaway. I think we've always known that. And in fact, I think if we speak about history, we know that you know, um, Chinese women were excluded um, you know, because they were deemed to be prostitutes, right? So we, what I'm telling you, you know, isn't anything that you don't already know. But if we are to make any progress, we can't look away. Our own humanity and that of a civilized society depends on it. So the moment that we're in around a global and mutated pandemic, yet another round of anti-Asian hostility rooted in this nation's long history of anti-Blackness, right? That's why we're coming together in this conversation here. More lives lost at the hands of the police, the fragility of democracy amidst brazen attempts to curtail voting rights and an economic crisis that continues to widen the wealth gap to seismic proportions and much more. So with that, I've got to take a deep breath. Um, this moment really feels like a turning point and one for the history books, right? Our living history and what we do 
and how we respond matters. I have been taught, you know, to know that um, history is not about the past, it is about the present and what we do with it. So now I work in philanthropy, a sector which is known mostly for the money that it dispenses, particularly in large quantities. Although the definition of philanthropy is a love of humanity, not money. You might have seen today, in fact, the recent the announcement of the launch of a new foundation. I don't know how many of you actually have seen that. It's called the Asian American Foundation, or TAF, which again launched today, um, and it's being hailed as the single largest philanthropic initiative to date, focused on Asian Americans. And it's true. Over the past 30 years, the level of foundation grants directed to AAPI communities has remained flatlined at 0.2%, meaning for every $100, it's 20 cents. Um, and even though foundation giving has significantly increased in the same period, and even when AAPIs are the fastest growing racial group with the largest wealth gap of any racial group between those at the highest and, and uh, lowest asset levels, that's what we have, right? So from that perspective of money investments, this is a new marker that will move the needle, provided that the other funders stay invested. You know, and these are some of the foundations that have funded some of the organizations that, you know, are represented here today. And that's really important, right? So this new foundation that just launched today is significant, not just in terms of the dollars being pledged. And we're talking 125 million from, the, from, the, um, from their uh, board um, and another 125 25 million that was pledged from foundations, other foundations um, and corporations to be $250 million. That's quite significant, right? You know, but it also is the influence behind the effort. And for the first time, we see Asian Americans of considerable wealth and influence publicly claiming the power in that identity in support of AAPI communities, right? Through a larger narrative of belonging in this country, that's their theme. But even so, we know that the lived expertise of those most directly impacted is where the real ground truth lies and where the most powerful movements begin. And you'll hear that I think over and over again. And I think, you know, Mei Chen, you'll be hearing you know, from her about some of that work that she did early on, you know. So let's mark this moment, being careful not to recreate the same power structures that got us here in the first place and use this opportunity to evolve an Asian American movement that builds on our relationships and aligns our work particularly with black, indigenous and Latinx communities in service to an inclusive and vibrant democracy for us all. When we talk about anti-Asian violence, we need to talk about it in the broader perspective of American democracy. And that is really important. So with that, um, I'm gonna have to head off. I'm really sorry to leave you when the, conversa when the conversation is really just uh, getting started. This hopefully provides a jumping off point for what I know is going to be a very rich discussion with the panelists and, and all of you. So thank you. Thank you, Pat. <clears throat> Appreciate it. Um, so now we're going to turn to Jack and Franklin. Um, one of the discourses that uh, comes to mind immediately in this moment, and especially with um, the kind of violent anti-Asian rhetoric of our former president around the China virus and the Kung flu, is this long history of the yellow peril, um, this long history of systematically dehumanizing and othering Asian peoples. Um, so in this broad historical scope, I'm curious, um, what about this moment strikes you as new and novel to this moment? And what is simply a rehashing and a replaying of um, tired old tropes of the yellow peril? So Jack and Franklin, if you could maybe just define and uh, speak to what the yellow peril phenomenon is and um, your reflections on this moment. So my esteemed elder should go first. Go ahead, Franklin. We decided um, <clears throat> age before beauty. Uh, so um, what I'd like to do, I, uh, what I'd like to do is 
talk a bit about homeland uh, traditional cultures, um, and in particular, uh, China and Japan, um, and talk about resistance and rebellion as, as core values in um, <clears throat> cultures that immigrants brought with them. I think more recent immigrants, the post-65 groups, have different stories to tell. But uh, let me just say from a personal uh, perspective that when I entered the struggle to establish Asian American studies in the late 1960s, I had spent a full decade studying early modern China and Japan, preparing then for what I thought would be a placid, peaceful, and prosperous career in the academy. Uh, that would have been at an elite research one university since those were the only institutions that could afford to hire a specialist in, in that sort of rarefied field. So when I discovered that the training conducted in um, <clears throat> elite institutions in the nation was really actually disastrous, not just neglecting the issues and events gripping the, the nation and globe, but really misinforming me and many others about events like the assassinations of JFK, Malcolm X, Bobby Kennedy, MLK, the race riots and upheavals, the third world liberation struggles, including the Vietnam Wars, the Cold War upheavals and more. So turning from my Cold War warrior training to ethnic studies advocate became, to me at least, um, <clears throat> a logical personal and professional imperative. But there were fortunately several carryovers from Asian studies to Asian American studies that were of great benefit, some of which I very much undervalued at the time. One was knowing the language and culture of the Chinese and Japanese immigrants who had left countries in turmoil only to enter societies like the United States, also in great transition, and <clears throat> who faced huge hurdles in terms of race and class and gender. So knowing something of their backgrounds helped me avoid stereotype mistakes commonly deployed by commentators, including media and other academic prof professionals. Being able to read and empathize with the immigrants helped me see the histories from their perspectives. One of the main lessons was to help prevent the twin evils of de depicting these immigrants, um, that is to say, seeing and depicting them as unalloyed heroes or diabolical demons. Thus, it would not surprise me when I learned that some of the key exploiters of the Japanese labor on Hawaii's sugar plantations or among the Chinese railroad workers uh, in the American West were Japanese and Chinese themselves who learned uh, quickly how to use their own people to earn money by collaborating with white bosses. There were other, other lessons, including understanding that these immigrants could be ultranationalists themselves with their own forms of racist attitudes towards other Asians and other peoples of color. But I wanna suggest that the, one of the major things that I learned was that, that the Chinese and Japanese immigrants must have understood their own histories and cultures, including a wide variety of historical examples of resistance, rebellion, and revolution. In China, for example, just think about the way we learn about Chinese history, that is epochs, historical epochs determined by dynasties. Each one, it should be understood, was established by class or religious or region, regional movements leading to a new dynasty. To take just the last one, the Manchu dynasty, lasting from 1644 to 1911, in the 19th century alone, there were at least 10 serious rebellions and civil wars involving a great deal of resistance, rebellion, and revolution. So even for common people who were not privileged and who were not able to read scholarly accounts, there were folk tales, stories, folk operas extolling the heroic virtues of gangs arising from peasant backgrounds to protect them and, and their communities from marauding bandits or oppressive landlords or bureaucrats. In Japan, similarly, um, <clears throat> the immigrants came from a society which was emerging from a feudal country striving to become a national power in order to avoid becoming yet another colonial victim to Western predators. In the process, the peasantry was ruthlessly exploited, hence, the need to emigrate to seek livelihood. And those who stayed behind were, were responsible for major rebellions, including the infamous 
uh, race riots of 1918 that involved perhaps a million people. And of course, the right-wing ultra-nationalist uprising that resulted in the disastrous Japanese militarist takeover in the 1930s. And people forget that um, uh, in, the, in the late 60s, when we were involved in the Asian American movement in anti-war protests and anti-racism actions, that in Japan itself in the 60s, there was a huge movement to protest Japan's crucial role supporting the United States in Southeast Asia. And I can still remember hearing about local farmers, national political parties and student groups protesting the government's expropriation of land to create the Narita International Airport we now all take for granted. So that heritage, I think, um, came with the immigrants. They knew about this and um, well, we have instances of quietude and lack of uh, rebellion and resistance. I think those, I think, can be also be understood and ex explained by historical circumstances, including Cold War, uh, FBI, Hoover, and, and so on. So let me, I want to stop there. Um, uh, I, do, I do think that law and order um, can prevail and, and is often imposed by authorities in control. Um, and sometimes that breaks down when we enter a period of crisis. Uh, this may be one, and COVID-19 may constitute um, the crisis of our, our time. Thank you. Yeah, so uh, maybe I'll just build on what Franklin is saying a little bit. I think in, in, um, in, in, uh, in any Asian uh, culture, society, sovereign uh, government, uh, any time there was an act of standing up against um, uh, for the sovereignty and against uh, British colonialism, for example, or American incursions uh, or wars in Asia, then uh, de facto there was a de declaration in which these people were really uh, enemies and part of a yellow peril. Um, so I'll just you know kind of make that transition to say that um, yes, yellow peril is deeply, deeply, deeply embedded in not just uh, Anglo-American culture, but also in um, Western civilizational uh, culture and discourse. Um, I'll just begin with um, uh, having a bad day and really, uh, as opposed to re referencing the Atlanta uh, killings, uh, to talk about George Washington just for a moment. <laughs> Uh, George Washington was having a bad day in the heat of the Revolutionary War in, in New York uh, when, because he was desperate to order some uh, the latest porcelains from China. So this would be his order from the latest um, porcelains from his Chinaman. Now the Chinaman was not uh, a Chinese person. It was a British merchant who was selling porcelains in the, in the, um, in the, uh, the lower, um, the lower kind of uh, uh, east side docks. Um, and uh, he, in the heat of the Revolutionary War, he still had to have that headquarters table with the proper kinds of settings. Um, now, of course, George Washington was also known by native peoples as the town destroyer uh, because he and his father had been surveyors, which of course was part of the kind of uh, the, the, um, the Anglo-American tradition of really uh, charting out uh, territories that they could then claim uh, for, you know, from deeds, from basically taking it from the native peoples, from the Lenape peoples, especially in, in the region of New York and New Jersey. And also, of course, George Washington uh, was the master of, uh, of about 100 uh, enslaved peoples. Um, so in some ways, just the example of George Washington, but I think we can take any of those founding fathers or mothers in that early period and understand the way in which um, dispossession of lands, enslavement of African, uh, African peoples, and also this uh, great desire uh, amongst the um, aspiring elites uh, who are trying to really establish their own identity to uh, want desperately, uh, quote unquote, oriental Asian uh, things and goods. 
Uh, so each of those groups were racialized in very particular ways, each differently, um, but I think they need to be understood together. And clearly a process of extraction that happened, uh, of course, in New York, but uh, throughout the Northeast and then how it spread across the country. Those processes were intertwining uh, people from very different places in ways that uh, perhaps we uh, are only starting to recognize now. So it's very easy to think about Asian American Pacific Islander histories as separate and distinct um, from those of African American studies and Caribbean studies and Latinx studies, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but they really are deeply intertwined. And I think that was understood at the beginning of Asian American studies, but it's even more understood now with the kind of uh, great increase of intersectional uh, studies. So I think we have to begin at the beginning of the formation of the nation, but also begin with the establishment of settler colonialism as well in this place that the you know, Anglo-Saxon Anglo um, political philosophers uh, claimed was, an, was a land in which uh, the peoples, the indigenous peoples lived uh, as part of the land and not having any kind of um, uh, relationship of cultivating the land or quote unquote owning the land. Um, so it's really important, I think, for us to understand what's happened to Asians, uh, both in terms of the kind of romantic um, uh, idealization um, and the, uh, the, the kind of ways in which, uh, let's say from George Washington's point of view, that um, China was a solution to some of what um, he and his, uh, and his generation desired to establish in terms of their identity of distinction. Uh, so on the one hand, there's a kind of a, a romantic um, uh, xenophilic uh, kind of relationship that uh, Washington had and his generation had with a place like China, Japan, East Asia. But that also was a very thin uh, kind of understanding which could easily flip in the other way to a phobic kind of relationship um, in which villainization uh, and um, China can quickly become a problem. It's not just amongst Asians, the different Asian uh, nationalities, the different Asian uh, nations, the different Asian empires, but also it was a flipping between groups so that on the one hand, um, African-Americans could be seen as the villains or, or, the, or the danger or the problem, whereas Asian-Americans could be elevated to being part of the solution, right? So in all cases, it's a form of dehumanization. I, I think part of what's um, specific and important about, um, about the ways in which Asian-Americans and Pacific Islanders have been racialized, it's really been in terms of uh, a certain kind of thingification through the trade, but also through foreign policy. So domestic policy, of course, is important, but foreign policy, immigration policy, border controls are kind of key. Uh, let me just wrap up there. There's a lot more to be said, but I'll just uh, begin with that. Thank you. Um, thank you, Jack and Franklin. Thank you for those transnational and uh, cross-racial comparative perspectives. Um, our next um, set of questions is for May Nye and Ted. Um, so Pat in her um, comments actually mentioned or alluded to um, the Page Act of 1875, um, which was in some ways the beginnings of this conflation between Asian women and sex work, um, which was very closely followed um, seven years later by the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882. Um, the ramifications of which we're still feeling today. So uh, May and Ted, could you talk about this um, early moment at the end of the 19th century, um, which we are still feeling and is still resonating with the events of today? Okay, should, should, should I go first, Ted? Is that okay? Or you wanna go first? We follow the idea that beauty goes first before age. Oh, okay. <laughs> I might be older than you, Ted, but anyway. No, I don't think so. Um, <laughs> Uh, I think it's really interesting that there's a lot of attention to the Page Act um, after the Atlanta shootings, um, because it's the lesser known of the Chinese Exclusion Acts, although it was the first Chinese Exclusion Act, um, and it later becomes subsumed by the General Exclusion Act, but it actually is the first. 
And I think we should refer to the Page Act as the first Chinese Exclusion Act. Um, and uh, what it did was um, it, it was built on the idea, um, the big lie, I think, of Asian American history, the big lie that Chinese people are unfree, that they, are cool, they were coolies or indentured laborers like slaves. And this was a kind of racial slur, I believe, to associate Chinese immigrants with African-American uh, enslaved people from the South. And the association of women with prostitution was the female analog to the unfree coolie laborer. And, and in fact, Chinese female sex workers were called slave girls, right? So both the, the male coolie and the female uh, prostitute were the embodiment of a racial, um, a, a, an idea that Chinese were an unfree race, the coolie race. And that was, um, as I said, uh, the big lie that continues to haunt us today. Um, Chinese men who came to this country were not indentured, they were not enslaved. They were voluntary immigrants. And the first people who came were independent gold prospectors. And they were in fact, very similar to people who came seeking gold from other parts of the country and other parts of the world. And there were Chinese women who were sex workers, but there were also women who were the wives of merchants, the wives of laborers, the wives of fishermen. Um, and uh, so, but they were all rendered invisible by this trope of the Chinese slave girl. And this was a kind of moral panic uh, against a so-called trafficking in enslaved labor and prostitutes uh, to stop Chinese immigration. And the, I think the real purpose of this was to uh, prevent population growth uh, through natural reproduction. So, um, so this led to a drastic decline in female immigration, separated families for generations, um, and it created the enduring uh, stereotype of the Chinese female and later all Asian women as hypersexualized um, women. So I'm gonna, I, I'm gonna leave it to Ted to talk more about the Exclusion Act, which subsumes this, the Page Act and, and its consequences, but I wanna take a step back for a moment and, and build on what Jack was talking about in terms of these, what we mean by entwined histories. And I wanna, you know, a lot of people have been talking since Atlanta about um, the long history of violence and discrimination that Chinese and other Asians have experienced in this country. But we don't actually focus on why. Why was there such hatred of Chinese people? Why was it? And why did it explode in the late 19th century? Um, and I think that uh, what's important for us to understand is that in the West um, at this time, there was a very special kind of racism, a very special kind of white supremacy based on the idea of manifest destiny, which is basically the idea that the West belongs to white people. And this was propounded in the 1840s um, as part of the continental expansion of the United States, um, which, could, which took place through native dispossession through going to war with Mexico and taking Mexico's northern half. And when white people got to the edge of the Pacific, they could look over their shoulder and see all that they had conquered through these uh, racist acts of dispossession and conquest. And they could look um, across the Pacific at the next frontier. And, um, and they were excited about that because that was another uh, prospects of conquest. Uh, colonial conquest, um, but it also provoked anxiety because they didn't want the people that would necessarily come with more contact. And this is where I, I, I think what Jack said is really important, this kind of what he called um, kind of xenophilic. Uh, I mean, I think it's actually a kind of colonial outlook because white people wanted, they, they, they desired China as a place for commerce and missionary work but they didn't want, they didn't desire Chinese people, right? Chinese people were undesirable, but Chinese goods or Chinese souls for saving, that was desirable. And so this, um, so why it's happening at this time, I think is important. It's not a coincidence that in the 1870s, the reconstruction in the South is overthrown by the old planter class and new capitalist class. Um, and Chinese exclusion, passes Congress with an alliance between the West and the South. 
So think about that. There was, there was some opposition to it from the North, from old anti-slavery uh, elements, but it's the West and the South that pushed exclusion through Congress. And if you look at a map today, where are all the red states? They're in the South and the West. So that is a very long legacy of strongholds of white supremacy. And this is a time when, um, you know, after the Civil War, the West and the South are being incorporated into a national capitalist economy, a national political body. And the question before both sections is on what grounds are they going to be part of the United States? What kind of country is the United States going to be? Is it going to be a democracy? Or is it going to be based on white supremacy? And we see the, the, those results. So, you know, as, as Jack noted, the kinds of racisms against Black people and Asian people are different, um, but they're both projects of white supremacy. And I think this is what we've, we've been handed is this legacy of exclusion, which does not exist in isolation um, uh, from the, the, the trajectory of American history. So I'm gonna turn it to Ted, who's gonna talk more about it, the Exclusion Act itself and its consequences. Yeah, I, I, I probably won't get to that area, but I do want to do oh, okay. <laughs> That's okay, uh, because a lot of people know about the 1882 law. We don't know so much about the Page Act, but the area that I really uh, like hearing from you and also from Jack was this, uh, especially this um, uh, union of the uh, confluence of interest between South and West. And one of the things I would really like to do is see more research related to how people who were just defeated in the Civil War brought their whole ideas of racism and race to the West. And so suddenly after that, you begin to see uh, uh, all these uh, California leading or setting up models that were basically uh, how to exclude uh, people that look differently, in this case, Chinese. And at this time, also after the Civil War, there's a huge couple of recessions and they're looking to exclude cheap labor. Now the, and they are targeting the visible people. In that case, it's the Chinese that have come from, uh, uh, come over for gold mines, railroads, uh, and so forth. 20,000 railroad workers recruited by the Union Pacific to work on the Transcontinental Railroad. You know, And at the time of the completion of the railroad, then you have a huge depression coming in and people are afraid of jobs. But I, I actually think the real factor is the racism and the racism that is characterized by people moving from the Confederate South having been defeated. We'd like to see more of that kind of research too. But the one thing is why did the first, and, and May, it's thank you very much for mentioning this is actually the first immigration law, uh, the Page Act. And it was th this act that decides that the basis of American immigration policy is gonna be restriction. It's going to be exclusion, right? I mean, if you look at, immigration laws around the country. Uh, I'm not a historian, I'm more like an immigration practitioner. Uh, you know, the, you could construct laws that say, how do we make our country stronger by welcoming people, but we don't. Our first laws was the Page Act. And that Page Act was specifically to exclude someone. And who did they exclude? Not the cheap labor that they were worrying about, but they excluded Chinese American women. They didn't say Chinese American women, say Mongolian, uh, race coming to uh, be prostitutes or uh, they were um, um, amoral or immoral. Another act that was passed uh, before that, the federal government was also looking at, they passed the anti Cooley Act and that was five years earlier, but that was not targeted at bringing in uh, concern about coolies coming to the United States. It's actually trying to be part of a worldwide effort to stop coolie trade to Cuba or to other places like that. It was also at the same time that they began to pass laws about uh, slave trade and things of this sort. So the people that pass these laws aren't necessarily all ill, Ill meaning. For example, a lot of the people that passed the, uh, the people that supported the Page Act could also have been said there was a missionary element that was trying to actually prevent women traff what we call today trafficking in women, right? But in any case, this law gets passed and a lot of the things that are it's based on is, um, is this, uh, it brings in the idea of cheap labor and introduces the idea of sexuality in our, in our immigration laws. It's based on those sort of assumptions that we talk about that 
uh, Chinese women uh, are immoral, they're second wives, they're concubines, they're slaves. Even we use those terms. If you look at the way that Chinese talk about uh, child brides and people that work in households, they do use the term slavery in Chinese to refer to these people, little slave girls. So there is that, it's a complicated story. But the bottom line is we've, we've created a, um, we begin to introduce ideas in the national mind that we have uh, to be concerned about immigration from Asia, Asian women, because they are sexually uh, uh, sexualized or, uh, and that theme continues uh, in modern day. But before we get to that, the two other impacts I just want to make very quickly before we go on is that the setting up of the PAGE Act to make it sort of a confrontational and a process of exclusion sets the stage for the 1882 Act and the rest of every Immigration Reform Act that comes about from the United States, except maybe for the 1965 Act. Every one of those are based on exclusion and it established a bureaucracy who gets their model of how to process things from, from their efforts to implement the Chinese Exclusion Acts, the Page Act, the Exclusion Act. I'm going to question you. I'm going to raise, I'm going to create an atmosphere and whole bureaucracy that is designed to be confrontational. So when you see Border Patrol or other people, and by the way, Border Patrol, the Mounted Border Patrol was actually established to not stop Mexicans. It was established originally to stop Chinese migration that was coming in from Mexico during the exclusion period. So, but the tactics and all the way the attitudes that we have, even as we establish new immigration and immigration policies today is based on exclusion. How do we keep people out? So that's one thing. The other, the other aspect that I do wanna say that uh, are the, the other consequence of the batch of the page out, of course, was the formation or the continuation of bachelor's communities and that whole Chinatown scene and the whole social pathology of sort of the Chinatowns that continues. That doesn't change until another understudied act, and that's the 1954, uh, the War Brides Act. And that shows you how important the, the, how significant it was when they excluded Chinese because the, of the, and then the inability to have families. When the Refugee Act comes, you do have the formation of families. You do have the changing of all sorts of, of, added, of, uh, of young families, people wanting to move out and so forth. So that's a very significant thing to look at. But the other, the, again, going back to the sexualization, that page at, you can say, continues a story arc that begins to say that women, particularly Chinese, Amer Chinese women or Asian women are sexualized. And it's either because of the page act, they're prostitutes. If you go on and other immigration, it becomes things that we are more familiar with from the 50s and 60s of say the uh, cherry blossom brides from Korea and Japan. Uh, and then it goes into the same story that talks about say Korean prostitution with that went along with army bases during the 60s and 70s. And it continues through the thought of what we're thinking in terms of Chinese massage people. And that brings us directly to the killings in Atlanta and all that is connected. And these are the legacies that are left behind and continues. Uh, so with that, I just sort of leave it and maybe we can continue discussion. Thank you, Ted. <clears throat> and thank you, May, for these um, broad historical pictures and um, deep historical contexts that um, show that these are not issues that are even just Asian American. Um, so thank you for that context. Um, I want to uh, turn it over to Mei Chen to actually pick up on um, what Ted was talking about at the very end in terms of, um, you know, Mei as a uh, labor activist and labor historian, um, when you look at something like the Atlanta shootings, um, how do you read this through the lens of labor history and especially a feminist labor history um, in terms of um, roles women are put in and um, opportunities or lack of opportunities um, for organizing and um, building um, a sense of power and security in the workforce. This is a really intriguing panel. And I think that we've touched on a lot of the historical roots of the racism and sexism faced by the Chinese and the Asians. 
And the Atlanta situation was very heartbreaking to me because as a labor organizer and sympathizer, it's always horrible when workers die on a day that they're just going to work or they, or they get injured. Um, and oftentimes because it's so hard to get any redress or compensation for these acts of violence, you find that the workers' lives have very little value. And this is especially true, as we pointed out from prior speakers, for Asian workers and especially for women. I mean, they, they used to have that saying, you don't have a Chinaman's chance. I mean, it literally was meant that your life was pretty worthless if you're a, work, if you're a worker. So the Atlanta case to me was a really horrific example of gun violence, which we've seen too much of in the last many years, as well as anti-Asian violence based on the racial and gender stereotypes that people have talked about. I mean, I would just add a little bit to what Ted was saying that uh, aside from the prostitution and those issues that happen within the United States, the um, military uh, actions of the United States in Asia, in many of the Asian countries, put them also in touch with prostitution and Asian women. And those ideas kind of came back to the United States with these very deep images. So the stereotypes of Asian women workers as exotic, as submissive, as victims, and then more than anything else, as cheap labor and expendable and having little value um, really underlie this whole situation in Atlanta and in many of these other acts of violence. So I wanted to flip that a little bit to talk about, talk about the reality of who the Asian women are and how to get that story out to the American public to counter these stereotypes. Because the, these stereotypes have been so drilled in that um, you know, we, we're not really addressing the story of who the, the people, who the Asian people are, to what extent are they integrated into American life. Uh, who, you know, where do they come from? I was happy when finally the victims in Atlanta were given names and faces and their families came forward and told a little bit about who they were and how much they cared about their families and communities. Um, my experience in working with Asian immigrant women showed me that they were very tough and determined survivors and that they really celebrated their life in the United States that it was very meaningful to them. They had a lot of um, you know, freedoms and opportunities of making a living that they may or may not have had in their uh, home countries, as much as they also faced discrimination and had to um, deal with a lot of challenges and hardships. The other reality I wanted to talk about that I think we need to use to counter the stereotypes is, has been referred to by a lot of the previous speakers in terms of the need to study the um, specifics of uh, anti-Asian, anti-Black, and you know, all these different manifestations of um, white supremacy, that idea of manifest destiny, how it impacted each of our different ethnic groups. Um, I feel that in the workplaces, having been, worked in the union for so long, there were many examples of cross-racial experiences in the American workplaces that are worth looking at and uh, looking, you know, and the friendships and alliances that were built in workplaces are valuable examples of um, solidarity and, um, you know, a building of togetherness of the people of color. Um, also, there are some cross-class alliances that are worth examining uh, in, in the workplace as well as in American society. Um, I think that we need to look at these intersections and alliances to be built between the Asians and these populations and the other ethnic groups in America. There's too much a sense that the Asians are either isolated 
or unique or different than others. And of course, that idea that we're always the foreigner has been a real albatross for us. So rather than drilling into that, I'm kind of in this frame of mind today of looking at the intersections between the Asian American experience and the experience of other American ethnic groups and other groups. Um, and I think that's to turn around some of the um, stereotyping and the, um, you know, these images that are put out there about who are the Asians. Thank you, May. And uh, thank you for raising um, these histories of cross-racial, cross-class solidarities. Um, hopefully we can pick up on that in a little bit. Um, so just so folks know on the panel, we have um, about 250 people watching right now. Um, and to everyone out there watching on YouTube, um, thank you for joining us. Joining us, Thank you for being here. In just a few minutes, we're going to open up to your questions. So if you'd like to ask a question, um, use the chat feature in YouTube. And we have people um, watching for those questions who will relay them to me. Um, OK. And so to continue on this theme of linking um, the everyday and the global, um, we're going to turn to Kevin and Vijay. Um, so Kevin, you know, you've done a lot of research and study on microaggressions. Um, this very helpful term that we've come to use recently to describe um, these everyday counters that might be called insignificant, but actually quite violent. Um, so Kevin, I was hoping you could speak to just what are the psychic and emotional tolls um, of a moment like this, uh, where people are afraid to go in the street, where people are being harassed and experiencing encounters um, like this on a daily basis. You know, the count is something like 4,000 or so anti-Asian um, incidents in the last year, but we all know the count is probably much higher than that. Yeah, and thanks, Ryan. Thanks again for um, everyone for setting the tone. I mean, I think one thing that I want to do before I even start talking about microaggressions and um, linking those two things is, is just to talk a little bit about um, some of the history that we haven't talked about yet, uh, including um, the many other ethnic groups that have been affected by Asian exclusion acts and so forth. Um, you know, thinking about Filipinos who first landed here in 1587, which oftentimes is left out of Asian American history. Um, to the Filipino people that were uh, as, as affected uh, by um, a lot of the different uh, anti-Asian violence and, and hate violence um, from the 1930 um, Watsonville riots uh, to some of the other uh, acts of hate that also occurred. Um, so while the laws, legislation were written par particularly towards Chinese people and Chinese immigrants that were coming in, other Asian people were, were just as affected um, and maybe even affected in different ways too. Um, Filipinos at the time were oftentimes uh, even sexualized as um, themselves or, or viewed as hypersexualized men who were rapists or uh, who would sexually assault women um, as other Asian American men were, um, which led to uh, even more of this um, anti-Filipino sentiment between white men towards Filipino men. And so, you know, I would be uh, missing the opportunity as the current vice president of the Filipino American National Historical Society if I didn't insert some of that Filipino American history in it. Um, I think it's also important for us to talk about um, that it, it isn't just uh, that uh, there were these acts of anti-Asian violence in the eight, late 1800s and some early 1900s, um, but to also talk about, um, and then to say that all of a sudden post COVID uh, or during COVID that these, in, the, these acts of violence had increased um, when we're missing out all of the anti-Asian violence that happened post 9-11 and post the 2016 election um, towards South Asians and Muslim people or people who are perceived as being Muslim. Um, and, and that's something that I think is really important for our community to really recognize is uh, the ways that we tend to center East Asian experiences as um, what Asian American history and Asian American studies is. And we forget about South Asians, Southeast Asians, Filipino Americans and Brown Asians in general. So I just want to, you know, respectfully add that to this conversation, that we can't um, continue to do that anymore. We have to include all of our different voices. Um, so with that being said, um, you know, tying history to microaggressions um, is something that is uh, both easy and difficult to do. Um, easy because we see very obvious links between things like um, the Page Act and the stereotypes that were uh, created about Asian women and the current um, uh, or 
the current uh, sexualization and exoticization of Asian American women. Um, we also see uh, the links between um, the model minority myth that was uh, introduced in the 1960s after the 1965 Asian, uh, Immigration and Naturalization Act um, and how that still affects the ways that Asian Americans are treated today and the ways that Asian Americans are oftentimes pitted against um, other Black, Indigenous, and other people of color. Um, and um, at the same time, it's, it's difficult because a lot of times people don't even recognize this history. I mean, I am excited and happy that people are talking um, about uh, the Asian Exclusion Act or the PAGE Act or um, all of these uh, different historical events um, in American history. Um, but I'm also deeply disturbed that it takes uh, dozens of people who have been killed, um, thousands of people who have been attacked uh, for this to even um, be a consideration. Um, why isn't Asian American studies integrated uh, into all curricula from K through 12 and through higher education and beyond? Um, why aren't people learning um, about Asian American history um, as part of just uh, their educational um, experience. And I think that's something that we as Asian Americans um, and other people of color um, need to really fight for. Um, I also think it's something that um, as Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders, especially if we're going to use this umbrella term, that we have to also include uh, the history of imperialism in Pacific Islander countries and nations and how the United States has essentially stolen and colonized these lands and has led to their slow genocide as well. Um, and so these are things that are th very, very important for us to, to talk about. Um, I, uh, since the question was not about microaggressions, you know, for the past 20 years, um, I've been studying microaggressions understanding the impact of microaggressions on mental health um, under uh, the mentorship of Dr. Gerald Wing Sue when I was in my doctoral program at Columbia, um, and then now with uh, dozens of folks who, who really try to really understand um, how microaggressions affect Asian Americans in our everyday lives, um, that every single type of microaggression um, that we experience is all really a manifestation of white supremacy and systemic oppression. So every microaggression, um, such as uh, people who view us as perpetual foreigners, um, that goes back to the historical oppression of, of people who, um, or Asian people and Asian American people who have uh, been deemed as being un-American or um, not being, uh, ever really being viewed or perceived as, as being American enough. Um, when we think about microaggressions involving things um, like exoticization, we also view back to the stereotypes that uh, were created through these various legislations and so forth. Um, and so, you know, I think um, the last piece I wanna say is that based on uh, your phenotype and skin color and how uh, what type of Asian American you are, you might experience a whole array of microaggressions, right? And that's something that I think we need to talk about as well. So if you're South Asian, um, you might experience microaggressions in which people might stereotype you as being a terrorist um, or uh, say Islamophobic things towards you versus if you are East Asian American, you might experience some of these microaggressions related to uh, this anti- uh, Asian or um, the, the COVID types of uh, rhetoric that has been uh, spewed over the past year or so, so forth. Um, and then Southeast Asians, Filipino Americans, oftentimes stereotyped as being the opposite of the model minority, um, not being smart enough, being um, uneducated, savage, uncivilized, and so forth. And so those are types of microaggressions that people experience. So my last point is um, that we need to continue to have conversations about the, the, the unique and uh, diverse perspectives of Asian Americans. Um, we also need to talk about intersectionalities and not just with gender as we've been doing on this panel, but intersectionalities with uh, things like sexual orientation and gender identity, immigration status, religion, age, et cetera. Um, and I hope that uh, you know, with the rest of the month that we have, uh, that we continue to be really intentional about being inclusive about all Asian American uh, subgroups um, and really making sure that uh, we cover all of their experiences. So thank you. Thank you, Kevin, for that inclusive look. Um, and um, to Vijay, um, so multiple panelists have touched on and mentioned um, how what is happening um, in this moment in America is no separate than um, legacies and histories of US empire. 
Um, so just to name outright that for mo much of the 20th century, the US has actively been at war with an Asian country, um, if not in a Cold War. Um, and then there are overt forms of US militarism and more subtle forms of um, US empire, like um, you know, importing workers. And um, so Vijay, could you just speak a little bit to this moment um, in the history of US empire in Asia and um, how that's playing into and informing this anti-Asian violence? Uh, sure, it's, it's great to be here. Thanks, Ryan. Um, when Nancy asked me to join you here, I decided to do some research um, and I read, well, I went to the internet, sorry, um, it's different from reading. And I found an enormous amount of liberal commentary on how terrible, how appalling anti-Asian violence is. There was something in the New York Times, there was something in the Washington Post, there was a long piece in National Geographic. I, I, I found that interesting. Um, there was something in, you know, every single uh, liberal magazine, you know, the nation had a pretty strong piece and so on. Um, and I thought, well, everybody's against anti-Asian violence. That's charming and amazing and provoked, of course, by the events in Atlanta. So what's the problem? There's no problem, you know. Um, the liberal consensus is that anti-race or racism is a bad thing. So just leave it at that. Go home, relax. Um, the liberal consensus is there's nothing to see here. Um, it's fine, you know. Okay, there's some nutcase, and let's leave it at that. Let's leave it at you know the yokel, the racist, the 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 person who needs education. They need a vaccine against their racism. But as far as the liberal, you know. Uh, elites are concerned, it's nobody believes in racism, apparently. And this is where it gets sticky, of course, because um, it's one thing to say, you know, we're, we're not racist. And that's, that's fine. It's charming again. It's one thing to say that. And it's another to actually explore the history of um, the United States, its wars of aggression, its um, advantages, the advantages, the immense advantages of racism. Um, you know, the first US war, direct war in Asia, well, there's many ways to calculate this, but at least one early war is the US involvement in the, in the second opium war. And, you know, it turns out that all these characters, you know, whether it's the Forbes family, the Astor Place, you know, family, the family that names that place in New York City, Astor Place, the Forbes, the Astors, the Cushings, the Cabots, the Delanos, you know, that's FDR's grandfather. All of them made their money in opium. They were essentially drug dealers uh, forcing the Chinese population uh, to, to buy opium so that they could, you know, make money uh, through the sale of tea and so on. A, a story that's not as familiar as it should be, by the way, um, that these people were drug dealers. And uh, a lot of the, the construction of the railroad of the United States, the trans, you know, continental railroad is financed by drug money um, on the backs of the Chinese people. And in immense, I mean, as, as Jack knows, because this is in his book on the yellow, uh, an immense, um, you know, amount of these stereotypes come out of that era. Uh, it's not just the ch Chinese population and then broader Asian population migrating into the west coast of the United States that engenders stereotypes. These stereotypes come partly in that war and then get brought into the United States. And let's not forget these wars. And, and then the advantages of the war, the capital created by the smug liberals of today who are so against racism, but unable to realize that their, their feet up to their knees, if not their waists, are deep in the wealth of that theft which they've never accounted for. There's never been an accounting in the United States for its complicity in the barbaric wars against the Filipino people. Barbaric wars, the holding of the Philippines. It's not just the Second Opium War. The United States participates in the Boxer War, Boxer Rebellion, to, to put the boxers down. The United States participates, um, of course, in the war in China, but then when the Chinese revolution takes place in 49, the big question is who lost China as if, as if a, a person in the United States has any role in the destiny of the Chinese people. 
the Chinese people had just created a, rev a revolution. And in the United States, the, the discussion was who lost China? Because China is your bank. China is where you make the money from. China is what should be there merely for you to aggrandize yourself. China is not for the Chinese people. It's for essentially the smug white liberals to make their money, you know, and then turn it around, launder it. This is their laundry. This is not the other laundry. This is their money laundry. Launder their reputations so that they come off, you know, perfectly pristine. White hands, white hands, no blood on my hands, no red hands, white hands. That is completely forgotten. None of these articles in the Washington Post, the New York Times, all, mind you, all against racism, none of them account for this. And therefore, they're against ra racism against Asian Americans, but it's okay to be racist against China. That's fine. You can still talk about, you know, President Xi Jinping as an oriental despot. 1.4 billion people and the Chinese apparently haven't figured out how to create any system of governance and how to create any system of getting their views heard. Um, none, because it's an oriental despotism. Combination old-fashioned racism with anti-communism. It's easy. It's a potent mix. Xi Jinping is an oriental despot. The Chinese are too stupid, actually, to create their own technology. They must have stolen it from Americans. And by the way, it's really interesting because then who designed the technology? Sometimes it's Chinese migrants into the United States that may have designed you know, this or that piece of technology. They're smart when they come to the United States. When the Chinese become Chinese American, they're intelligent. When the Chinese are in China, they're thieves. You tell me if the actual smug liberal elite, which is so against racism, is actually against racism or if they're merely American exceptionalists. If all those articles in the Washington Post and the New York Times, they're not anti-racist articles, they're American exceptionalist articles. Because what they're saying is Asian Americans are exceptional. Once you become an Asian American, you must be immune from being treated like an Asian. But Asians can be treated like Asians. You see, it's okay to go and bomb the Asians. It's okay to destroy Iraq. But an Iraqi American is after all an American. And I want us to think about this. I want us to think about this liberal attitude to Atlanta. Because it all becomes about Atlanta and it's not about the racism against China today, this Cold War that it's not only Trump, but it's Biden prosecuting. The way in which Antony Blinken talked to Councillor Wang in Anchorage, Alaska was an act of racism. You see, two diplomats meet, and I'm sorry, Ryan, I'm going to take a few extra seconds to, to make this point. When two diplomats meet, they typically say, so pleased to see you. This is Anchorage, Alaska. It's the gateway of the Americas to Asia. You, when, you, I hope you have time to eat some salmon. It's, it's tremendous here. And, and Councillor Wang then responds saying, I'm so pleased to be in the United States. I, I was in Washington, D.C. earlier, but it's wonderful to be in Anchorage. I do believe that from Anchorage, you can see Moscow and, you know, they, they crack a few jokes and, and it's, but no, no friends, Anthony Blinken, who prides himself at sophistication because he speaks French, came to the table and started abusing the Chinese saying, you don't understand the rules-based order. Let me tell you something about the rules-based order. It's the United States that prosecuted an illegal war against Iraq. It's not China. China has not prosecuted an illegal war against any of these countries. You don't understand the rules-based order and a US diplomat has the nerve in 2021 to tell any country about how they should behave. And especially a country like China, where the memory of the humiliations of the 19th century are taught in schools as part of their curriculum. They learn about the opium war. Nobody in the United States knows a damn thing about the history of the United States in China and the role of the US in the opium war in China. Not one student knows a damn thing about that. They just know how great the United States is because there used to be racism and now everybody is an enlightened person like the flipping editorial board of the New York Times. It's okay to be anti-racist when the racism is against Asian Americans. And I quite agree with Mei Chen. 
these are workers, they have no value. And yet it provoked a certain kind of outrage. Oh my God, Asians in the United States cannot be treated like this. But if we treat Asians in Asia like this, well, that's business as usual, as long as we're making money in our businesses. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Vijay. Um, and thank you for picking up on a thread that I think runs through much of this, which is to really deflate and challenge a lot of very subtle prevailing ideologies that um, are informing our popular discourse right now. Um, so we are now going to turn to questions uh, from the audience. Um, thank you so much for opening up all of these um, rich topics. We could clearly go on for days um, with this group. Um, the first one I want to open up, um, which is something that I also had wanted to ask this panel, um, is about Asian American resistance. So we've done a lot to set up um, the structural policy, institutional uh, racism that um, informs this moment, but um, are there specific moments or examples of um, resistance, anti-racism, anti-colonialism that we can point to that um, from history that help to maybe point a way forward in this moment? Um, and specifically, this person asked, um, you know, if there is an influence or maybe even a dialogue between um, resistance in America to anti-imperialist, anti-colonial movements in Asia that we could draw. Okay, I'll start off. Um, there's a lot, a long history of resistance against racism and exclusion. Um, you know, Chinese on the gold fields in California carried knives and guns with them to protect themselves. And they devised methods so that they could resist attacks. Um, and as well, I mean, I, you know, I don't want to get into a whole digression about the jurisprudence of immigration, but the immigration laws in this country are based on a series of cases brought to the Supreme Court by Chinese. And Chinese took to the courts uh, because exclusion meant that they couldn't vote, they couldn't become citizens. And so they couldn't use the political process to influence policy, but they used the courts um, thanks to the 14th amendment, which said that all persons, not just citizens have rights of due process and equal protection. So um, there's a very long history of uh, civil rights litigation uh, brought by Chinese um, Chinese Americans and, and Chinese immigrants um, around everything from discrimination in workplaces to the, the right to exclude itself, right? Um, to birthright citizenship, um, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, and then, you know, I mean, I think, you know, I mean, Mei Chen is, is really familiar with uh, in more recent times, the, the struggles of Chinese and other Asian workers um, against their exploitation and for better working conditions. But anyway, I, I'm just gonna start off with throw those out because everybody else has, I'm sure has tons of examples, but our communities have always fought back. Can, can I just jump in there? I mean, you mentioned uh, labor activists. I mean, I think a really ideal um, moment in history to look at are the Filipino farm workers in the 1960s who joined coalitions with the Chicano Mexican American farm workers right, right. in the 1960s for the great labor uh, strike, great grape strike um, of 1965. Um, and I think from that, um, we recognize a couple of things. One is that we, when we work together in solidarity with other communities of color, we can be more successful when the Mexicans um, were, uh, independently trying to do um, their organizing, the Filipinos um, did their organizing. And for, in fact, the Filipinos were the first to strike by themselves. Um, they weren't successful, but it was when they worked in coalition with the Chicanos. Similarly, the fight for ethnic studies, as I'm sure many people on this panel have been part of, um, has been um, a really a, successful when we work together across um, other communities of color. Um, I'm also thinking about, um, uh, for Filipino Americans specifically, the um, anti-Marcos, anti-martial law movements um, from the 1960s, um, which eventually led to, uh, you know, the ousting of the Marcos family and the, uh, the tyranny and the corruption that was in the Philippines. Um, and so, you know, there are so many different movements um, that exist. Um, I think uh, the things that, that for me that I take away from it is the solidarity um, is so important um, for us to work together. Um, and then, and then the, just the general um, 
uh, caregiving and community um, organizing. I mean, just recently I was reading about, um, speaking of court cases, and I promise I'll be really quickly uh, quick. I was reading about the anti-miscegenation laws recently um, uh, affecting particularly um, Filipino Americans because for Filipinos in the 1930s, uh, there was a, a little a tidbit in the law in which they tried to fight that they could marry uh, white people because uh, the laws in California at the time said uh, that, uh, that uh, interracial marriage was forbidden between Mongolians and Caucasians. And so Filipinos made the argument that we are of the Malay race. And so therefore this <laughs> California law doesn't apply to us. Um, and so Filipino Americans um, fought in the courts. They found some, some loopholes, some courts that allowed them to get married um, until it went to, to, to the, the state Supreme Court and, and they eventually um, banned all uh, Malays, Mongolians and non-white people from marrying white people. But one of the things that I liked about this story um, in reading about this um, was that the Filipinos um, actually created community organizing, the original social media, the original uh, social networking. Um, they told people which courthouses they could go to in which clerks would, would let them um, get married. They told them about out of state um, uh, courthouses where they could go um, even providing transportation, letting people borrow their cars um, so that they can go to those, those out of state courthouses. So those are the types of things that we still need um, to do today. We keep ourselves um, safe. We keep ourselves uh, you know, um, able to, uh, to fight together. We all do our parts. And so I think we need to model some of those, um, those movements from, of the past. Thank you, Kevin. I think it was Franklin, Ted, Vijay. Uh, I just I just wanted to if you if you look at the history of uh, Japanese workers in the Hawaii sugar plantations, it's replete with strikes. Not not just the major ones in 1909, 1920, but almost every year um, there were strikes, uprisings of one kind or another. But I, I wanted to say that <clears throat> when when the Asian American studies, I think studies movements began, uh, Kevin mentioned, um, uh, a lot of solidarity. We, we, the collaborations and solidarities with the, the Black Panther Party, the um, American Indian movement, um, the Chicano movement the, the, in the Southwest and, and solidarity with um, the people of Vietnam, for example, during the war. Uh, were extremely important. And people who, in the Venceremos uh, Brigade who went down to C Cuba uh, in that period, were all, I think, uh, manifestations of uh, people who were uh, anti-colonial and um, anti-imperial and, and seeking to establish um, <clears throat> solidarities with uh, these struggles across the globe. I just want to mention very quickly, uh, couple of examples probably other people know but maybe not is that the largest the largest industrial action that occurred at that time was a strike by Chinese railroad workers on the Transcontinental Railroad. They eventually lost the strike. It was, uh, but the but there was people the point is that people were organizing doing these things that were going on. Maybe there's so many more that we don't know about. But the other one is also talking about intersectionality and things that we do is uh, is that we know Brown, how important Brown versus Board of Education is, but how many people know that 30 years before Brown versus Board of Education, it was the Gong Lum case in Mississippi in which a Chinese girl tried to get into a white school. That case went to the Supreme Court. Again, that decision didn't fall in favor of the, of the Chinese person. In fact, the Supreme Court affirmed separate but equal. And then it took later on uh, more action to eventually get the Brown versus Board of Education. But the one thing that I do also want to talk about is that I don't know how many people, if there is, if there is a liberal immigration law, one that I said that almost all our laws are based on exclusion. But if you talk about one that is, that is, uh, that was really based on, um, on uh, some liberal principles about people coming into the United States, that's the 1965 Act. And that got rid of national quotas and and that sort of thing. But I would argue that that National Coda, that 1965 Act was actually one of three acts that came out of the civil rights movement, both the, the Voting Rights Act and the Equal, Equal Rights Act. They should be talked about as three things that emerged out of the civil rights uh, movement. And what I would like to say, especially in the current temperature of people saying they wanna go their own way, a lot of Chinese population, uh, 
uh, current Chinese efforts uh, on cases against affirmative actions. And so for sure, remember what we're saying is the collaboration among all these peoples in that movement that brought about these really substantial laws that have benefited us. Yeah, so uh, I mean, there are lots of historians here, so I fear to tread into this territory. But when I was researching, everybody was Kung Fu fighting, which is more um, a book of jokes than, than a history book. Uh, I have, was very fortunate to get to UCLA and I looked through the issues of Gidra, which is a terrific, really terrific journal. And I highly recommend it just for the covers if you don't want to read the text. Just read. And lots of people here know a lot about that magazine. So I'm not, I don't presume to say anything. And I can see you smiling for good reason. You deserve to be smiling. Um, you know, there were now what's interesting about this period is I would make the argument that the modern Asian American movement is rooted in opposition to war. Um, Asian Americans for peace, the anti Vietnam war or anti US war on Vietnam. Sorry, there's no Vietnam war. The anti United States war on Vietnam is what galvanizes the Asian American movement. And I feel like in a lot of the literature, this gets minimized. Um, there were people who said, you know, I'm, I'm, uh, I was born at the time when my parents were in internment camps uh, during World War II, and, and now I just cannot tolerate what's being done in Southeast Asia. And even though I'm, I'm Japanese American, this war in Southeast Asia is intolerable to me. Uh, this is not strictly speaking identity politics. This is politics. Um, and there's a long history of Asian American opposition to U.S. imperialism, you know, whether it's Bayan movement regarding not only Philippines. I mean, Bayan is anti-imperialist, not just about the Philippines. And now there's Pivot to Peace. Highly recommend people find out about Pivot to Peace. It's formed to basically dial down the temperature on this U.S. hybrid war on China. This is a long and noble tradition in the pop in the history of Asians in, in the United States, a very long and noble tradition of opposing war, opposing militarism and so on, not just wars in Asia. This is one thing that's important, but wars everywhere. Um, this is an obscene country. It's a country whose ruling class is contempt for the world. Um, you know, it believes that it can just, I mean, the fact that Biden can say publicly that we want to basically devour the 21st century is repulsive to me, you know, that a liberal president can talk about how the 21st century should be the 21st century of the United States of America is repulsive. It's repulsive. And, you know, if you're a sensitive and sensible person, you just have to oppose this. So there's a long noble history of opposing it. And I think things like pivot to peace, they are the heir of Asian Americans for peace and so on. And I really hope people go check out their website, pivot for peace, something or the other. Yeah, I just want to say something very quick. I mean, I agree absolutely with Kevin's point that we have to go to, for example, Manila Acapulco and earlier kinds of moments in the Americas and to really take all that into account and not just to uh, uh, kind of raise the U.S. experience as somehow the proto prototype for all experiences. Uh, but it's also to say that in every single port culture in which there are Westerners going into um, non-Western ports of call, there is resistance, every single bit of that. There are people jumping ship, jumping on ships. There are people uh, trying to really uh, work around um, the power uh, of, of armed uh, control, but also financial control. So really that history is, is deep um, and from the very beginning of those kinds of contexts. So I just wanted to kind of say that because I think the problem is really more a problem of the archive and a problem more of our lack of documentation. Uh, Franklin made the point about language, uh, the lack of uh, mining um, the multiple languages that that uh, that still have uh, those archives and to really build that and make that accessible to a broader group of people. So um, let me just say that because it's not about a lack of the actual actions that people have taken, but it's really a lack of our acknowledgement and awareness of them. Thank you, Jack. Um, so we are, we have five more minutes. Can I get a quick thumbs up from the panelists if you're okay with taking one more question and going a little bit over time? We're good with that. Fantastic. Um, so this question touches on um, the last point Jack was making about the needs for archive and documentation. You know, Vijay mentioned 
American kids knowing nothing about the opium wars, among many other things. Um, and so two questions came in. Um, one about, um, you know, equipping teachers colleges to get Asian American history to K through 12 teachers. Um, another one is um, what big idea, what one thing would you want um, a fourth grade teacher um, to talk about with their students right now during APA Heritage Month with all the anti-Asian violence going on right now? Uh, what would you offer? I know we have a lot of educators in the audience um, who would love to hear from this. Um, you know, DOE has really supported this series. Um, and, you know, for those who are maybe uh, not in the academy or um, not uh, teachers in the little job sense, you know, how do we expand the field of Asian American studies even beyond the classroom? Um, so I'll leave it to you to respond um, however feels right to you. Yeah, on the last question and, and a little bit on this question, I wanted to comment about the Asian language presses that operate in the United States because a lot of the information that people who are immigrants to this country from Asia get are in the languages of their newspapers, magazines, and so on. And I just um, had this project of translating a friend's book from Chinese into English. And she used to be a journalist for one of the Chinese newspapers. And she wrote about all of these examples of struggles, resistance, discrimination, as she perceived um, in this book, which is, you know, I said this has to be in English because people have to be able to read some of this stuff. But I think also for the young people, it is important to have um, ethnic studies. I mean, information about all the different ethnic groups in the curriculum of the schools and in a way that um, reflects the contributions, the struggles and the, um, you know, the life of these diverse people. And then one last point uh, to connect with um, Kevin and Vijay was about imperialism. I think that the Asian immigrant population has brought a very deep awareness of American and other imperialist actions in their countries to their consciousness. And I think that's a big factor in um, struggles for peace and for um, mutual respect in the way that we all deal with each other. Great, uh, I think Ted and then May Knight. Why, why don't we let May go on? We only have a few minutes yes, and I, uh, she hasn't had a chance to speak as much. Well, thank you, Ted, that's really kind. Um, I would suggest for uh, teachers that you Google a speech that Frederick Douglass gave in 1869 when he opposed the Chinese exclusion idea. And uh, it's a remarkable speech because he basically says, let them come, let everybody come. This country should be for everybody. Anybody who wants to come, let them in. And if millions come, so what? He said, so what? Let them come, they'll become part of this country and they'll become Americans like you and me. And I want America to be a home for black people, for um, uh, Europeans, for uh, Latinos, and, and for the Chinese. And he said, and this is, goes back to this link to imperialism. He says, if you say that we have to close the borders of this country, to, at, that this continent is only for white people, then that's going to lead you, meaning America, to claim any part of the world and say it's only for you, yes. and that you will try to rule the whole world that way. And so he made this amazing connection between exclusion as an immigration policy and colonialism as a foreign policy. He said, it's all part of the same thing. And so you can find this online, Frederick Douglass, 1869. It's a speech he made in Boston, uh, of why he opposed Chinese exclusion. And it's a really democratic vision of what an open immigration system would look like. And you know, he said, let them come. Let them come. Millions. OK, <laughs> if they want to come, they should come. And I think it's it's amazing. And I'm surprised that we don't publicize yeah. this remarkable analysis, um, uh, you know, more than that we should. You know, can I say just a few very quick words? I, 
Mace, thank you so much for mentioning the Frederick Douglass speech. It really is remarkable. It does require you to sort of be able to read through the type of style that they were writing at that time. But uh, two other things in terms of public education that uh, we've been working with and we promote a lot in the 1882 Foundation is that we uh, ethnic studies is something that we should all promote, but we like to promote embedding the topics within current curriculum. So if you look at core curriculum, uh, you don't necessarily have enough time for the teacher to talk, teach a separate class on ethnic studies, but they have to teach about government. They have to talk about civics. And from there, what we should do is they can embed examples from the Asian American story. And so our obligation or our responsibility may be to help develop the lesson plans or the research, the topics, so that we can teach the teachers to how to incorporate it into core American curriculum. That's number one. The other two things is it's not just public education in the classroom you need to think about what are the public structures or monuments that we hold up as a nation of thing, as things that we need to pass down. So you have to ask yourself, how many national monuments are there in the United States? National monument or national landmark needs a congressional approval or presidential approval. How many are Asian Americans related? And Franklin has worked on this under the theme study for over five years, but that is something you should do. You should look at where are the national monuments that reflect the values that we want. But we, of course, we also want to get rid of those national monuments that don't reflect the values we want. But the main thing for us in a positive sense is let's find those national monuments and get them nominated so that a person who is not necessarily a scholar, but is visiting a place can be reminded that this is a very important story site and uh, for both America and the Asian American uh, story, uh, which is part of the American story. The second thing I've talked very quickly is where are our American heroes? How many National Medal of Honor people have we gotten? I think Obama and his administration started going through old nominations of people who won, uh, who had uh, who were honored and uh, how many didn't get a medal of honor because of racism. But there are maybe, there are probably more. And one, for example, in the Korean War, we have uh, uh, the one again, Frank, another one Franklin is involved in is uh, Smithsonian's talk about the Kurt, Kurt Lee, who basically saved 8,000 soldiers in the Battle of Chosun. How come he is not nominated or has an, a gold medal, a um, congressional, Medal of Honor, but his superior got one, right? These type of questions are things that bring into the education or the psychic or awareness of us is uh, the stories of Asian Americans being part of the construction and the building of the country. So we want to look at the classrooms, but let us look at the public education, the monuments that we use to educate average people or people in the visiting places. Those we should also focus on. And it was great that Pat talked about the, the Asian American uh, Foundation that just got established. Because really, you look at how much money in the National Endowment of Humanities is dedicated to underserved communities. And the answer is very, very little. Sometimes it was like $500,000 out of the budget in one year, spread against 50 states, or however they're going to do it. <laughs> but this one, we really should look at uh, the, uh, the, the, the Asian American Fund and us educators and us public educators, those in the museums and, and uh, historical societies should look at how we can look for permanent markers that educate not just within the classroom, but on a day-to-day -day basis when we're walking on our, on, uh, or doing our uh, visiting places and sites. Thank you, Ted. Any um, last responses? I, if I might, um, I applaud all of these efforts and I've, I've been personally engaged in some of them working at the Smithsonian, for example, to try to um, establish the fact that we, we really need to incorporate um, our stories into all of these places and not just necessarily as add-ons in a separate unit uh, for K-12 to, K to folks, but in uh, national historic sites, historic houses, and, and, and so on. Um, <clears throat> but it's, but, you know, being a visiting professor at a liberal, at an elite liberal arts college in Western Massachusetts 
has reminded me that we, we, we haven't won this fight in higher education yet. I mean, I mean we have so far to go uh, to um, even uh, educate the people who want to be educated about their own heritage and the history of this country. And, and uh, the kinds of things that Vijay talks about, uh, although we may not be as passionate or as eloquent as, as he is in uh, remarking, remarking about what, what kind of place we live in and you know, asking people whether they really wanna assimilate, uh, uh, to what degree do we, do we elect to assimilate in, into this uh, society or what are our responsibilities um, for, for facing uh, the hist historical and contemporary truths about, about our society. Uh, so, you know, um, we have a long ways to go in uh, all of these sectors. Thank you. I think Kevin and then Jack. Yeah, I mean, I just want to reiterate that, that we definitely need um, ethnic studies. I also think that there is a practical element of integrating um, as much Asian American history into existing curricula. Um, and then I also think since the question was about what can we tell a fourth grade teacher, um, I think teachers really need to realize that you all have a voice. Um, if you all organize together and fight back against your school districts about curricula that you find to be problematic and even outright racist, um, then, then perhaps you all need to use your voices to advocate against that. I mean, I think for me, I'm all about abolition in so many different ways, but especially with our educational system, we have to stop teaching people um, that settlers came here into the United States and that Thanksgiving was peaceful um, and that we didn't, that the country wasn't based on the genocide of the native indigenous people, as well as um, on this, the enslavement of, of people taken from their homelands. Um, we have to really teach them the honest truth. Um, and until we get to that point, um, we're going to continue to live in this neoliberal uh, false narrative in which people don't realize uh, what the United States really is. Um, and I think that um, it really takes, uh, you know, many of us who are doing activism and advocacy for ethnic studies to do our parts. Uh, but I also think that teachers themselves um, who aren't necessarily ethnic studies teachers, um, but who just want to be truth tellers to their students um, that they need uh, to organize. Um, and I know it's hard and I know that it is uh, even scary and daunting. Um, but uh, if not you, then who is going to make this change? You know, this has not changed across generations. We're still teaching um, first graders about Thanksgiving um, being, you know, this thing that we celebrate. And in fact, we as a country still celebrate, um, or many people do, not necessarily me, um, but people still celebrate this as a, as a, a national holiday as opposed to a national day of mourning. Um, so if we all need to do our parts and we all um, can can, can fight against you know the systemic oppression, um, then maybe we can make it a little bit better for the next generation. Um, and then just a very practical note, if you want something for a fourth grader to read, I highly suggest a Journey for Justice, uh, the story of Larry Itliong. Um, it talks about the United Farm Workers and uh, the great uh, strike of 1965, fourth grade reading level. I'll just say that I, I absolutely agree that we have to move from a from an identity of expertise and therefore only after acquiring years and years of expertise, being able to teach it. I think we have to jump into this process and really th be thinking of ourselves as organizers and making interventions and really drawing from the good materials that are actually plentiful out there. Um, at the same time, I wanna just strike the note that uh, global warming and, and the cascading impacts of global warming are something that we should all be working on. And sometimes I'm thinking that we're looking at, oh, what's gonna happen five years from now? Uh, ethnic studies have been being pushed for how many decades? So there's a long trajectory there, but also the ways in which I think we have to organize together are gonna to be around the shared uh, issues that we're all facing in all different regions of, of the nation and figuring out how to build those relationships in which it's both grappling with global warming, but also grappling with these other questions. Um, I don't think we have the luxury of time and thinking of ourselves as having all these decades to continue to fight in the way we have fought. I think the, that, that clock is actually uh, pretty pretty scary right now. It's, it's very urgent for us to actually move into a different kind of mode of work that we're doing. By the way, it's um, today is May 4th, which is a very important day in Chinese history. And it opens the door to the Chinese revolution. 
And there's a lot of resistance also that takes place outside the shores of the United States. And it would be nice for people to have a universal understanding of emancipation and not a parceled out understanding of emancipation. Um, you know, so it is, of course, important to study um, ethnic studies and Asian American history, but it's really important to have a generous uh, understanding of, of the human and the natural experience. Uh, so cheers to May 4th. Um, it opened a great door uh, for the Chinese people and for the rest of the colonized world that looked to China um, and looked to the experience of uh, Chinese you know, people and, of course, artists who um, demonstrated the great potential of people to fight against imperialism. The next Quiet Before panel will continue this conversation on history and context. That'll be on Thursday. May 6, uh, Curtis Chin, Diane Fugino, Ed Tedborn, Felicia Lowe, Luis Francia, Suki Ports, Erica Moritsugu, moderated by Andy Shao. Please join us for that. Um, some of the topics that they or the subsequent Quiet Before panels can take up that were raised here today, um, cross-racial solidarity, histories of cross-racial solidarity, what that means in this moment, um, dismantling ideologies of white supremacy and empire in the classroom, in our public spaces, in the public media, um, the environmental catastrophe collapse we are facing right now as no separate than, um, you know, anti-Asian uh, histories of industrialism, individualism, Western imperialism, um, Intra-API conversations, um, breaking out of an East Asian-centric focus, um, broadening our conversation of who is included in the definition of API, API communities, um, just to name a few. So I want to thank this incredible panel for opening up and offering all these rich, rich topics for discussion. Ted, Franklin, Vijay, Mei Chen, Kevin, Jack, and Mei Nai. Uh, thank you to all of you watching. Um, thank you to the teachers out there. Thank you to the activists out there. Thank you to the organizers. Thank you to the historians. Um, you know, we are really happy to provide and offer this conversation. I hope um, you left with at least one thing that uh, nourishes you and carries you forward in this difficult time. Um, and did I mention we have we had about three thousand playbacks? About three thousand logged on at some point tonight. So, um, yes. Okay. Um, let's say good night. Happy May Fourth, everyone. <laughs>